Hello, welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to Yoda Programming using Scala. This video begins a brief uh, introduction to the topic of refactoring. Um, refactoring is, is a, an approach to dealing with code, uh, and when you refactor your code, you make changes to how things are done without changing what is done. The general idea is that as your program gets bigger and bigger, you might have situations where it's doing the right thing, but the way that it's doing it just isn't quite ideal. Okay? And that part of the it isn't quite ideal leads into this, this first topic, and this is the actual term that is used for this. Uh, your code becomes smelly. Okay? Now, just like with the, the sense of smell, uh, this is something that can uh, vary between people. So maybe two people don't agree whether something smells bad or not. Same thing happens in your code. A lot of the smells that occur in code are a matter of degree, okay, and not just uh, an absolute. If you want to learn more about refactoring, the, there literally is a book by uh, Martin Fowler, and it's called Refactoring. Uh, I, in, in my book, I go over a few of the different smells and a few of the refactorings, especially the refactorings that are present inside of Eclipse, but I don't go over everything. I don't even get close to it. In this video, I want to talk about a few of the different smells that can occur inside of, inside of your code. And I'll pull up Eclipse, so I don't really know how much I'm going to be utilizing it. Uh, so let's talk about some of the different smells that, that we could have inside of our code. Maybe we'll pull up a, um, here's a, a class, which I'm hoping my code that I wrote here isn't too smelly. Uh, maybe something inside of our drawing program would also, oh, well, we're using the, the E class, um, might have some smells there as well. So. A few of the things that you might find in code that can be smelly. Uh, we could also look in the API. In fact, there are some great smells in the Java API. Uh, and part of the reason why they're there, oops, have an extra O there. These smells are there in some ways because parts of the API were written before people really had a good idea of how they should be doing things inside of Java. And so they went back and they changed things uh, and, and revised them. But you wind up with some, some things that aren't quite right in, in here. Um, and, and after they did this, they, they realized their mistakes and they, they cleaned things up generally when they could. But because it was part of an API and because people were relying on it, they could only change so much. So one possible smell, I'm going to go through a number of the smells kind of in alphabetical order. We'll, we'll have another video following this, probably finishing off my list, uh, is alternate classes with different interfaces. Okay, so an example of this is something that we have seen in uh, encoding. At the very least, it's, it's present inside of the book. Uh, there are two interfaces here inside of Java, one called an enumeration and one called an iterator. And these two do very different th or do, do very, very similar things. So that's the whole idea of alternate classes with different interfaces. You have two classes, they do almost the same thing, and in particular, or maybe the classes don't do the same thing, they have methods that do the same thing. Now in Scala's libraries, for example, if you're dealing with collections, there is a method called map, and it's always called map. They, they don't have any situations where they called it by something else. Well, in the case of an enumeration, enumeration is supposed to let you walk through a collection. So it has these methods called next element and has more elements. Yeah. Enumeration isn't used anymore in the Java API, and it's, it's, it's present for historical reasons. The things that used it initially still continue to use it, but everything has switched over to iterator. And you'll note that iterator has a next method and it has next method as opposed to the next element and the has more elements methods that were in 
the enumeration. Those methods do exactly the same thing. Okay, next element does exactly what next does, has more elements, does exactly what has next does. Uh, this one is more verbose, and at least that's at least part of why they shortened it down because no one ha wants to have to type in next element and has next element. They'd much rather just type in next and has next. So this is an example of alternate classes with different interfaces. Why is this a smell? Well, because when you're actually coding and you think to yourself, oh, I need to call the method that does blank. Okay? If all of your classes, when you have a method that does blank, they all use the same name for it, it's very easy to remember what you need to call your method and probably what you need to pass into it as well. However, when you have a situation like this, you have to think, wait, am I dealing with an iterator? Am I dealing with an enumeration? Because they use different methods. Obviously, Eclipse helps you a bit here because it will give you a drop-down box of all the methods, but it's still, it's still nice if you are uniform in the method names that you use for different tasks. Turns out this iterator while, uh, also shows an example of another smell in the, the, that can pop up. And this is called a, a refused bequest. Okay. We talked about inheritance. And in inheritance, when you're inheriting from something, you, you're inheriting because you want this, you want to be a subtype, you want to exemplify the is a relationship. But just because you have the is a relationship doesn't mean that you should inherit. And one of the situations where you shouldn't inherit is when the supertype has a number of methods that the subtype really shouldn't use. Okay, that's exactly what we got with our mutable rectangle. We found that a square, a mutable square, should not inherit from the mutable rectangle because the mutable rectangle had methods in it that, that we weren't supposed to, to use. And I can probably bring up um, these little examples in here. Yeah, so we had our mutable rectangle. And the thing was, it had, so okay, getting width and height, that's fine, but the mutation of being able to set width and height, that was a bit more problematic. And we originally made it so that our square inherits from the rectangle, but this causes some significant challenges for us because now the square is getting these two methods and they shouldn't be, uh, th those are things that we shouldn't be able to do on the square. So this is the smell called a refused bequest, where you are inheriting something and you don't want it. Now I mentioned that this also pops up here in the iterator, and there are places in the Java API where you will see this, optional operation. Okay. That right there is an indication of a refused bequest. Okay. The, all iterators have to have a next and a has next, but you're allowed to make an iterator that where the remove method is supposed to throw an unsupported operation exception. Okay, so you're allowed to write an iterator and make it so that when they call remove, instead of actually doing the remove, it throws an exception. Uh, while this is in the Java libraries, and I'm sure that there were reasons why they wanted to do this, this is very smelly. Okay, this means that when you write your code, in general, you can't trust an iterator to use remove. So fundamentally it's unsafe to use remove on, idiot, on any iterators in Java unless you know details of the implementation. And unfortunately those details of the implementation might change in the future and so they could wind up breaking your code. And it's not even a, a break of a, of a syntax error, this is a break of a runtime error. You won't know it until you actually run the code and you hit a case where it calls remove on, on an iterator that can't do it. Okay, so we've talked about our alternate classes with different interfaces. We've talked about refused bequests. This next one, and I know there are lots of faculty members who are probably going to see this and, and grumble, but it is listed as a smell in the refactoring book, and I think for a very good reason. Another possible smell is comments. Now, you could make the strong argument that the code that I have in here is smelly in terms of comments in the sense that I have none. Uh, part of that is simply the fact that I'm, these videos are supposed to stay short and I'm not going to, to put in a whole bunch, spend a lot of time writing comments in here. 
But this is one of these areas where too many comments can be actually worse than too few. Okay. I like to make my code self-documenting in that I use method names that are kind of standard and understandable. Uh, I also, you know, th this isn't really a great example because I got it from Buffer, though this fits with the, because I'm using the standard methods that are part of the Scala Collections class, anyone who is familiar with the Scala Collection classes knows what these methods are supposed to do, and some way there isn't, I shouldn't write a whole bunch of comments for it. One of the worst smells that can happen with comments. So if you litter your code with too many comments, there's not enough code, and, and inevitably a lot of your comments aren't needed. I and mean, if, if I were to put here increment num elms by one, this is a stupid comment. Okay, This is a smelly comment right here because it's obvious what this line is doing to anyone who knows how to program. Putting this comment in here is, is pointless. It was just a waste of my typing. What's even worse is what happens if I do that? This is the type of thing, and you're like, well, I would never do that. Um, but it turns out that it's if you have lots of comments in your code, as you maintain the code, as the code evolves over time, you have to make sure that your comments evolve over time as well. And now we have this really horrible situation where the code and the comment say different things. Okay? And the reality is the comment doesn't do anything. So the comment is always wrong in this situation. It's the code that's actually happening. And so this is really bad when you're working in teams because if someone, if you have a comment and it was a needed comment because you have code that is challenging to understand, uh, someone might read your comments and say, oh, that's what that does. But if the comment doesn't agree with the code, they don't go bother looking into the code and then they assume that it does the wrong thing and, and that winds up being very bad. So you have to be really careful with your comments, especially when you're talking about maintaining your code. Putting in comments initially, um, reasonable comments, comments for places that are hard for people to understand. Also definitely, you know, Scala doc comments that will, that you put in here that uh, can be used for, for generating documentation. Those are great things to have. Uh, that is indeed how they generate the, the API. And, and those are remarkably useful but they have to be maintained. Okay, so comments get smelly when you have pointless comments or when you have comments that haven't been maintained with the code. Okay, let's pick a, another, um, uh, we'll pick two more smells for this video. Uh, these are fairly simple ones. The first is large class, okay, and then the second one is long method. This class right here, it was under a hundred lines. Uh, if you start having classes that are thousands of lines long, and I have to admit I've had a project where I had classes that were thousands of lines long, they're probably too big. You probably need to look into refactoring them. Uh, and We'll come back to, to describe exactly how you would do that in, in a bit. But that, when your class gets too long, that's smelly. Okay? Why? because it becomes hard to maintain. In the case of long methods, the, the significance is actually very upfront. Studies have shown that there is a very particular length to a method that is significant. Once you go over this length, you're likely to start having problems. In fact, your probability of having bugs goes up dramatically. And that magic length happens to be the size of your editor window. Basically, as soon as your method gets long enough that you can't see the whole thing all at once, your odds of screwing something up go up dramatically because all of a sudden you're not relying upon your eyes, you're relying upon your memory. And humans have very faulty memory. Okay, so you want to keep your methods fairly short. I also hate to admit that I had a project where I had a method that was over a thousand lines long in it. And what did I do? I refactored it. I refactored it using tools that we'll talk about in, in the, the coming videos because it can actually be challenging to break apart a method that big and get all the pieces to do what they're supposed to do. 
but you really, really don't want to have extremely long methods and you really don't want to have extremely large classes. If you start finding that you have either of those, you need to break them down. You need to take that class and break it into multiple separate classes. You need to take the method and, and break it apart. And we'll talk about the different refactoring techniques for, for how you can do that. So those are our first uh, five smells. And I'll come back in the next video and we'll talk about some more.